Here we go again. New district maps have been drawn, voted on, and approved. We have an expert panel to break down the big changes and the challenges to the new maps. Hello and welcome to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. After years of legal back and forth and several redraws, the new congressional district maps have been fully approved by the legislature. Let's take a closer look at the districts that you, the voters, find yourselves in. A closer look at the new map signed into law by the governor. Leaders say it differs slightly from the map proposed by the Independent Redistricting Commission to ensure incumbents don't have any unfair protection. This map has received bipartisan support. However, if there are any further challenges, they must be taken up in New York County, Westchester County, Albany County, or Erie County. That move drawing negative reaction from Republicans. First of all, the notion that a court, a state Supreme Court judge in Jefferson County in Niagara County, in Steuben County, is not capable of ruling on that is nonsense. It happened two years ago. They didn't like the result of the ruling, and that's why we're here. To give us a better understanding of the current state of the redistricting, we've got an expert panel today. Very lucky to have David Lombardo, host of WCNY's The Capitol Press Room. Jeff Weiss, the senior fellow with the New York Law School's uh, Census and Redistricting Institute. Gentlemen, thanks for coming in. Pleasure to be here. I don't know who wants to jump in first. Um, I feel like, and this is me, you guys know it better than I do, but if, looking from the outside in, if there was an easy way to do something and a hard way to do something, we always seem to pick the hard way in Albany. Uh, is it, am I being too cynical or does it always feel that way? Well, no matter how re redistricting gets done, it's always taken time, it's contentious, it's confusing, it's, it's political. It's often called the blood sport of American politics. I think that's just what we've seen in the last two years. Although I think the safe thing to say is that in 2024, the process is going a lot smoother than what we saw in 2022. Uh, as we've heard from some Republican leaders around the state, we're unlikely to see a, a meaningful legal challenge to the lines that we've gotten uh, this week from the state legislature. So the congressional maps that we've got are, are likely going to be the congressional maps that we're running candidates on in November. Will this one stick, do you think, for a while? Is what's the, what's the uh, It looks like it. The Republicans have all, you know, have said uh, that this plan doesn't have anything to it to go to court over. Right. That the districts are fairer. Uh, they comport with the law. And I think the, you know, the wind is just out of the sails to uh, keep going to court. And unlike 2022, there were some Republicans in the state legislature who actually voted for these lines in the legislature. You had about three uh, Republicans in the state Senate and about a dozen in the assembly. And that goes a long way in making that argument that these are, quote unquote, bipartisan lines, even though it was Democrats who actually held the pen. Yeah, that's true. For those who don't live this stuff every day, wh why we re draw the maps at all? Is it the census numbers change and was it about every 10 years you have to look at this? Well, we get down to uh, the U.S. Constitution which requires that a census be taken once every 10 years. And the original purpose was to apportion congressional districts among the states. Uh, but over the years, and really beginning in the 1960s, you know, the courts, in a case called Baker v. Carr, uh, they've ruled that every district in the country, whether it's congressional, state legislative, city council, must have equal representation, one person, one vote. So after every decennial census, the numbers are tallied, they're sent to the states, and every local jurisdiction up to the state legislature and the congressional delegation lines have to get redrawn. You want to well, the that? variable, though, is how the lines get redrawn. And for decades in New York, this was something that was deferred to the state legislature. We've seen courts uh, have to take on the responsibility when the legislature can't get their act together. And in the wake of the most recent one, back in 2012, uh, the legislature, with the support of then Governor Andrew Cuomo, amended uh, the process. And that's why we entered sort of this uncharted territory in 2022. And as we saw, there was some uh, growing pains uh, as we tried to execute that process. This independent commission, uh, how long has it been around? Well, it was created by a constitutional amendment that the voters approved in 2014. So it's a brand new process. We've just gone through unprecedented, unchartered waters and very bumpy waters. Uh, the commission itself is called independent on paper, but it really isn't because the legislature has final say as to what plan goes into effect. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. How independent can you be? If I make you guys the independent commission to decide where we go for lunch and you guys both decide on Chipotle and I say, you know what, I don't want Chipotle. I'm going to toss out your decision and we're going to Ted's Fish yeah. Fry. Uh, 
you're not very independent. Is that is that what we're seeing here, or am I being too simplistic? It's right? really more or less so-called independent. In fact, in 2014, when the ballot question was before the voters, the state courts ruled that in the explanation on the ballot, you can't use the word independent because it wasn't independent except on paper. In the amendment, that word was used. And who gets put on the commission? Because that could also affect where lines get drawn, right? Well, people are on the commission by virtue of having been appointed by the, uh, the four legislative leaders, the speaker, the Senate president, and the two minority leaders. And the thing to remember about the composition of the commission, most importantly, is that it is bipartisan. It is split five to five, and in order for them to advance maps, there needs to be a majority, actually more than just a simple 51% uh, majority, to move lines to the legislature for their approval. And what we saw in 2022 was that Democrats and Republicans, surprise, surprise, couldn't agree on lines that had real implications for control of the House, and that ended up kicking the process eventually to a special master to draw the lines that we saw in 2022. In 2024, there was this new sense of camaraderie, a kumbaya moment, Democrats loving Republicans, mm -hmm. cats and dogs playing together, and these maps got approved by a nine to one vote. And so when they came before the legislature, Republicans made the argument that hey, these are bipartisan maps. Why are you tinkering with these, Democrats? There's right. bipartisan support. Let's run with these. And what was the rationale? They, they, they liked it mostly, but they wanted to um, tweak a little bit? Well, the official explanation <laughs> was that uh, too many counties and localities were split, uh, that the constitutional standards weren't followed, um, that there were infirmities that they wanted to fix. When you're drawing a district, are you trying to get 50-50 with Democrats and Republicans, in a, or is that impossible in, the, in, a, in yeah, any it's state? It's generally, uh, that's an illusory uh, concept because if you draw a 50-50 district, you, you never know who's going to win. There are no assurances that if you draw a district that might be 70% Democrat, 30% Republican, that the Democrat will win. You'd always need to have good candidates, good issues, and good turnout. Yeah, there are a variety of considerations that need to be taken into uh, consideration when you're drawing these lines. So compactness is something that needs to be thought about. Communities of interest, counties, uh, like Jeff mentioned. Uh, there's also concerns about uh, protecting minority populations and their ability uh, to have representation that, that looks like them. Uh, but then the people who are actually controlling the lines, in this case the legislature right. and the Democrats, they have their own partisan interests. And I think they were feeling some pressure from national Democrats, like Assembly Minority, Congressional Minority Leader uh, uh, Hakeem Jeffries to draw lines that would be more favorable to Democrats uh, in the wake of how poorly uh, Democrats did in 2022 in New York, uh, not nearly cleaning up as well as they'd hoped to. That's I want to hit on that. You know, a lot of the headlines were the maps got redrawn and uh, Republicans flipped a bunch of seats and it influenced the House. Was that all the maps fault or was there something else going on with, with the politics of the state where people were looking at what's happening around them and they wanted to vote a different way? Poli yeah, go ahead. I think politics were the real issue in 2022. The maps that uh, Republicans uh, did very well on set up very well for Democrats to win back in 2024. I, I think what we saw were strong Republican candidates uh, around the state who rode the coattails or the anti uh, Kathy Hochul vote in 2022. These districts that we're thinking about on Long Island, in the Hudson Valley, and, and Central New York set up very well for Democrats in a presidential year. Uh, there's seats that got more than 55% Joe Biden votes, but are represented by Republicans. So if I'm Mike Lawler, a Republican in the Hudson Valley, Brandon Williams, a Republican in Central New York, I'm not necessarily buying any you know, green bananas in right. October. Gotcha. Yeah, keep in mind also, looking back in the state's history, the Democrats who've controlled the assembly since 1975 won their majority based on lines drawn by Republicans in the early 70s. Similarly, this, the state Senate went Democratic uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the late 2000s and again uh, uh, several years ago on lines that were drawn by Senate Republicans. So you can never really guarantee over a decade's period of time how each district will turn out. A uh, loaded question going off the reservation a little bit with this, but you know, can a Republican win a statewide uh, office anymore, the way things are, are falling with demographics in New York? Or would it take a really strong candidate to like see a, a George Pataki take the seat again of governor? It really depends on, on the, the candidates and the issues, the climate. We saw last year how uh, Lee Zeldin was so successful on Long Island where the media market from New York City spilled over on immigration, on crime. Uh, these issues you know, resonated and uh, you know, he came very close.
Yeah, 2016 with the presidential election was a good reminder that anything is possible. Probable is another question, though, John. Uh, we might have seen a Republican ceiling in, in 2022 with Z Lee Zeldin's really strong uh, performance. Maybe if populations shift, maybe if issues change, Republicans can uh, build support for a statewide candidate moving forward. But right now, for the foreseeable future, Democrats have to feel very comfortable, whether it's a candidate running for U.S. Senate or governor here in New York. Last minute, um, and this is again, since I have you here, I, I get a sense from my perspective, the legislature's... Kathy Hochul might be a little bit easier to deal with for, for many of them than Andrew Cuomo, who had such a strong personality. Is that a fair assessment, or uh, is, it, is it just uh, all the sausage making behind the scenes and, you know? I think it's different. I think that there was hope that Governor Kathy Hochul would represent this breath of fresh air who was ready to reach across the, the, to the legislature and work with them on a variety of issues. And in some cases, that's borne out, but in others where the governor wants what she wants and the legislature wants what they want, they are still coming uh, to head, as we saw last year with the governor trying to push a housing package that went nowhere. So uh, Gov Governor Kathy Hochul might be the friendlier version of Andrew Cuomo, but you know, not necessarily getting everything she wants from the legislature. Gotcha. And keep in mind that Andrew Cuomo, when this whole process started, tried to control the commission by uh, controlling its budget, its staffing, so he delayed this process from getting going. Uh, Kathy Hochul said a few days ago that she was not going to put her finger into this yet. Okay, we'll see if that holds true. Uh, David Lombardo, Jeff Weiss, thanks for coming in today. We really do appreciate it. And have a good session, the rest of the session. We don't keep you busy. Thanks a lot, John. Okay. Uh, increasing the access to mental health resources among school-age kids. When we come back, we'll be talking with a school administrator on the governor's new push to help teenagers struggling with mental health issues. By the way, if you have a comment or story idea about this segment or any segment, let us know. Email us at news at news10.com. You can also reach out on X, which most of us still call Twitter, at WTEN. Welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. Uh, this week, Governor Hochul continuing her administration's push to support uh, mental health needs of New Yorkers. Now, the governor announcing applications are open on a rolling basis for mental health providers to apply for funding to start school-based clinics. Some $20 million have been allocated for these applications and part of the $1 billion set aside for mental health in the state budget. In addition, applications are open now for the state's Youth Mental Health Advisory Board, the board providing middle and high school students the opportunity to share their mental health experiences with policymakers. The governor making these announcements at a visit to Mahonison Central School District in the Capital Region, where she pledged the state's continual support for the mental health of students. A reminder that if you uh, or someone you know is struggling with a mental health issue, you can always uh, call or text 988 to reach the Suicide or Crisis Lifeline. It's free, it's confidential, and it's available 24-7. Joining us now to give additional insight on developing programs to help students deal with mental health challenges, Deborah Cavanaugh. She's an administrator in charge of the Student Mental Health Services at Mahonis School right here uh, outside Albany area in the Capital Region. Uh, Deborah, thanks for coming on today. Thanks, John, and thanks for allowing Mahonis the opportunity to discuss and bring awareness um, to the critical issue of youth mental health in schools. Well, I'll start with the fun part first. Having the governor come to your school district, that's a pretty big deal. That had to be an exciting day for you. Yeah, it was definitely a proud moment for our school district. Um, like we know that mental health wellness is critical to academic success, you know, and the overall well-being of our students. We worked really hard as a district to target um, and invest our resources to educate our students and faculty and mental wellness. Um, so having that recognition and having conversation uh, with Governor Hochul was really an amazing opportunity. When we hear the phrase, like we're to help children, like at Mahonison or a different school district, what age are we talking about? From age five on up, the, the whole years you have them, or is there a specific age range you're really targeting? Yeah, I mean, I would say all children, all school age children. Um, you know, we have st students in, you know, as early as kindergartners who are struggling with mental health issues all the way up you know, through our high school level. And the money that's coming to you, explain how it's gonna be used and how it's gonna help. 
So the funding that Governor Hochul is proposing is critical. Um, we've kind of paved the way a little bit here at Mohanesen in that back in 2018, we already contracted with Northern Rivers to provide a school-based mental health clinic here and you know in our district. We have a clinic at our middle level and also at our high school level. Um, and so this funding would allow um, other school districts and also, you know, if we certainly wanted to expand our um, school-based programs in terms of, you know, uh, early intervention at the lower levels, this funding would be critical to providing uh, schools with the ability to have those school-based clinics right within the school district for uh, children who need support. And the program, every, every time there's a school shooting or something, we, we, especially politicians will jump up and say, well, we need more mental health uh, help in schools or, more, or at home or wherever. But I would assume um, the issues you're dealing with with these kids is, is, is not th that end of the spectrum where it's rage or somebody acting out that way. There's a lot of other issues that they're struggling with, depression or other things, right? Yeah, I mean, as you know, you know, childhood and adolescence can be, you know, exciting for kids, but can also be a really uh, challenging time. You know, a time where they're trying to figure out who they are, to form their identity. You know, they're they're figuring out how to regulate their behavior and to navigate interpersonal uh, skills. You know, and certainly that was challenged by the pandemic. There was a disruption to routines and structure, um, and for a lot of um, you know students and families, that resulted in a lot of isolation. You know, grief and loss related to, you know, whether it's not whether it was financial issues. You know, losing a family member, sickness. Um, so it was, it was quite a challenge for for many of our students who now you know are trying to navigate how to cope and deal with some of those, you know, emotions such as anxiety and depression. I look at someone uh, my age and I'm a, I almost feel blessed I didn't have social media around when I was uh, 12 or 13 or 14 years old because doesn't that just pile on and compound a lot of this stuff, the social media? I would imagine not only in the isolation where you just sit in your room uh, on a phone, but also in terms of bullying and those kind of things. Yeah, social media is it's certainly a challenge. Um, and I think that during the pandemic, it was, you know, in some ways um, a blessing to some students because it allowed them that connection that they didn't have during when things were locked down. They, you know, many students didn't have any connections with friends or, you know, even, you know, uh, people that they could talk to. So during the time of the pandemic, you know, the social media really became a way of life for students. They were learning you know, uh, using social media, and they were also connecting with others using social media. So um, and now it's kind of getting back to where is that balance between um, students connecting in person? You know, how do you create those healthy relationships, um, you know, when you're face to face with someone versus, you know, you know, just depending solely on uh, social media or um, your telephone to connect with people? We're down yeah, to, it certainly has created some challenges. Yeah, we're down to the last 20 seconds, but really quickly, I would think early intervention, getting these kids talking about what's going on with them is key, right? It is key. You know, we want our students to know, you know, um, what mental health looks like, where they can get support, what the red flags look like, how they can cope. Um, we want them to have their person in, in the school district. We want them to have their person in the school community. And this is all about creating an opportunity for them to be connected to uh, both people who understand and also resources and people that can help them when they're you know feeling challenged by some of these mental health issues. All right, I wish we had another half hour to talk about this. Deborah Cavanaugh with the Mahanison School District. Uh, thank you so much for what you're doing to help the kids and we appreciate you coming on today. Thanks, John, and thanks bringing light to this uh, again. We appreciate it. Of course. Uh, stunning uh, pushback from New York City's mayor over a controversial migrant laws. When we come back, we'll uh, break down uh, the changes Eric Adams is calling for in the city's sanctuary protections for migrants. And a reminder, if you have a comment or story idea, please tell us about it. Email us at news at news .com. You'll also find us on X, uh, always known as Twitter as well, WTEN. Welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. New York City Mayor Eric Adams is delivering strong pushback to the city's so-called sanctuary policies, saying he would back the efforts now to end these laws. 
The policies require any undocumented person to be convicted of a crime before city police can alert federal authorities and potentially deport the subject. The mayor now saying the law is impacting public safety amid high profile incidents of crimes committed by migrants. We can't have these small number of migrants and asylum seekers that have identified that they're going to be dangerous hide under the law. Some immigrant advocates have said, though, these laws protect law-abiding undocumented migrants by allowing victims and witnesses of crimes to interact with police without the fear of deportation. Stick around. We'll be back with a look at the week ahead in just a bit. Reminder, if you have a comment or story idea, please let us know about it. You can email us at news at news10.com. We're also on X, formerly known as Twitter, at WTEN. Finally, on Empire State Weekly, many residents across the state were impacted by a service outage from AT&T this past week. That outage left customers unable to make calls, send text messages, or access the Internet for up to 12 hours. New York's Attorney General Letitia James uh, saying that her office is going to be investigating the causes of the outage as well as the company's response to it. Saying in part, quoting now, nationwide outages are not just an inconvenience, they can be dangerous. And it's critical that we protect consumers when an outage occurs. We'll be sure to keep an eye on the story and bring you the latest developments as they come available. For now, from all of us here at Empire State Weekly, I'm John Gray in Albany. I'll see you right here next week. And don't forget, you can watch Empire State Weekly all over New York State. Here's a full schedule of where the show is carried on 10 TV stations across the great state of New York.